Y'all ready for the message? Yes. Yes. Do we have any Christians in the house? Yes. So you say you're a Christian. <laughs> what is a Christian? This is like everybody in here should be able to tell me what a Christian is, right? And what a Christian does. Well, let's look at some things this morning. We need to look at some, some things that the scriptures tell us, okay? A Christian is a person who has been born again, or one who has been born from above. Everybody, how many of y'all knew that? Yeah. Amen. All right. Well, where am I getting that from? Well, it was a, this guy named Nicodemus. Everybody ever heard of him? Oh, yeah. We came to Jesus at night. Okay, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us your miraculous signs or evidence uh, that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay? Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God, he tells him. Alright? Born again. What does that mean? Well... A Christian is a person who is born of water and of spirit. Now there are a lot of teachings out there that plug that water in as water baptismal. Okay? And it's not what it's, what's being told here. Okay? But we need to know this. A Christian is a person who is born of water. I say water? And spirit. Amen? Here it... What was that? Light one out. Front row. What do you mean, explain, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Okay? So Nicodemus is confused. There's a lot of confusion in the church today. There's a lot of fighting, a lot of bickering, and so forth. And I wonder at times, how many people that are out there that have large crowds are, are really born again? Okay? Because the born again experience, it seems like we should all be on the same page. We should all be after, you know, the same thing. And that same thing is that people know Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? That we should always want that. But I see a lot of different doctrines out there that's, you know, for trying to make people happy so they, they laugh throughout the whole service. They, they, uh, want, they roll around on the floor and they, they do other things and they preach the gospel of money and so many things. But, you know, to be born again, be born from above, it, it simply means that there is only, there's only one way. There's only one born again experience. And that experience should be opening up our mind, our soul, should be opening up our hearts to the truth of who Jesus is and what the Father is doing. You know, the big picture of the whole thing has nothing to do with, with money or stuff or vacations. Or on and on, I can go on and keep naming things. You know, even though we do these things, it's not a big deal. But I'm just saying, it's really not anything to do with that. Now, people are born in this world and we're born as sinners. We have a sin nature. Babies, they'll go to heaven if they were to die before they come to Christ. All right, but once they reach that age of accountability, that time frame that and it could fluctuate in each person when they start knowing right from wrong, when they start to understand good and evil type of thing, then they, they're going to have to get saved at that point. But little children, you know, if they die before that, they go right into heaven. The Lord said, forbid them not to come to me of such, of such is the kingdom of heaven, you know. You know, some people actually teach that if they die, you know, the Catholic Church used to believe in limbo. And then they changed it. They just said there's no such thing. But for centuries they believed in limbo. And that's where a child would go before they were christened and they died. But there's no such thing. And they're back in one of their councils they said, no such thing. So they got rid of it. So babies go to heaven. Amen. So when they have bought all these children that's so evil and they murder them in the womb, they go into heaven. Amen. Thank you. Somebody say amen. amen. You know, last, last year I read that last year they aborted a million babies. Wow, huh? And most of it, now they say, well, we, we, you know, there might have been incest or rape or something. But the percentage is of the murdered babies are just from fornicating. You know, they just want to have sex. 
they don't protect, they have a, then they get, they, they conceive, and then the girls go have abortion. So the majority, when I say majority, I'm talking 99 point something percent is just from sinning, just from fornicating. These little innocent babies are, de are, are put to death. Nicodemus was confused about this. How can I go back into my mother and, and womb, you know, and be born again? He's, and No, you have to be born of water and spirit. Ephesians 5.25 tells us what the water is, and it goes into husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her, the church, with a washing of water by the word. So we can see here that it's not water baptismal. That's a whole nother story. That's, that's doing something else that we are commanded to do. Even Jesus went and got baptized in water, even though he had no sin. Okay? And so there's a truth that's involved in it, which I'm not preaching that today. I have the messages on what water baptismal is all about, and that we are commanded to do it. But it's not something that's needed to go to heaven. But what is needed to go to heaven is right here. That we need to be washed in the water by the word. The word of God. Okay? You need to have all your sins washed away. And the truth of God's word beginning to infill you with the truth of God's word. Amen? Amen. So, this is what it's saying. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that she should be holy and without blemish. Alright? So, she's coming back for a church that's been washed by the Word of God. Saturated with the truth inside of us. You know, so, a born-again person is hungry for the Word of God. Thirsty for the Word of God. A person who's born again, they want to know more. They want to keep knowing more. And keep knowing Him more. And they want to go deeper and deeper with the Lord. A true born-again person that, that doesn't read or study, doesn't even care, just because they just want to go to heaven, that, that's not salvation. You know, when salvation comes, man, you, the Holy Spirit comes in and starts bringing understanding to why you need to be saved, that you needed a Savior. He begins to come and not speak on himself, it says in John 16, but he's going to take those that belong to Christ and begin to reveal truth to us. Okay? He's, going, he's the one who cleanses us he's by the Word of God. So when you, he starts going down deep into your soul, deep into your heart, and, and he's finding the trash. And he's, he's not going to just take it away from you. You have to yield it up. Just like no one's going to get saved, you know, just, just by God just saving us. You have to want to be. You have to use your faith. And so the process of sanctification is happening in our lives as he's purging us from things. How many of y'all understand what I'm saying? You know, that you've been purged from everything? No. You still find that you're able to sin? Well, when you do sin, he lets it happen because he's going to point it out. You know, I mean, I went out and weeded a garden one day. I mean, I dug up the mud so good and I, and I pulled it up by the roots and everything else. I mean, it wasn't like within two days there was more coming up. It's like, where is this coming from? I just weeded out everything, turned the mud and looking for, and it just, you know, they got, I, rem, I remember when they tore down houses out in the city. They've been sitting there for like 50 years, if not longer. And what happened? Two days later, there's grass growing. That's like, wait a minute. Did, did somebody come in overnight and plant that seed in the ground? No, it was laying there dormant when they put the house there. And it was just waiting for one day for the house to be removed. And then here it comes. So what, God, what is God going to do? God is going to literally remove things away to let the seed of your problems surface. That's a good thing. Okay? God wants you to, to be able to look inside of yourself just as much as he's looking into you. And he wants to purge you. He wants to purge you from fear. And he wants to plant faith. He wants to purge you from doubt, and he wants to put faith. He wants to keep putting faith wherever you have something, okay? He wants you, he wants you to grow and be the best witness you can be for him. And we go through things. Anybody going through anything? And things we don't want to go through? 
Your body's wearing out? You're having struggles? Well, welcome to the crowd. You know? I would run from a minister who says, everything's great, man. You never see me depressed or down or anything. I, was, I would be like, hmm, wonder what he's doing in private. <laughs> wonder what's going on. Because that guy is lying. I guarantee you he's lying. If he lives on this planet and he didn't come from another planet, then he's struggling. I don't care how much money he's got. I don't care. You know, he's not all, all you can have all the money on earth. Well, the profit of man to gain the whole world, lose a soul. You know, he can have all the money in the world, still get sick. Still subject to things. You know, I heard one minister, he's, he's a prosperity preacher and everything else, and he's been preaching faith, and, you know, and I'm going to live to be 120. I don't know why he wants to do that, but anyway. And, uh, and, and then he, he's in his 80s, and he's got hearing aids. <laughs> and boy, the other people that's been after all of these prosperity preachers, they jumped on the bandwagon with it. That's how I found out. It's on YouTube, you know. And what did he say? He justified it. He said, y'all wear glasses, that's, that's eye aids. So I'm wearing hearing aids. And it's like, well, you've been preaching this strict faith move. Why didn't you pray for your ears to be healed? And that's what everybody else is saying. You know what I'm saying? So you see, even the ones that preach all of that deep stuff and prosperity, they get sick. They need hearing aids. Or glasses. And not only does he have hearing aids. See I didn't know any of this. It's on YouTube. Because once it happens. They go shoot, shoot the cannon off. God said I'm going to announce it from the mountaintop. He's got a pacemaker. <laughs> Which I don't care. I'm not against the pacemaker. My mother's got a pacemaker. You know she's 92 years old. And, and so forth. I mean it, that don't trouble me. I mean, y'all go went to the doctor and you've had some things done. Thank God for doctors, because all three of my babies was she. It came out of her belly. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't do that. We needed a doctor that knows how to do that. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm not against doctors or hospitals or any of that kind of stuff. God has increased knowledge in the land. But when you start like preaching to a place where you convict people, make people feel bad because they go to a doctor, and then you yourself go to a doctor, something's wrong with that. Amen. How did I get on this to begin with? <laughs> Amen. Because I'm talking about the true gospel. I'm talking about the reality of Christianity. And now God already knows your future. He already knows, you know, what's going to get a hold of you one day in your life. And he already knows why it's going to get a hold of you. And in many cases, it gets a hold of us because we don't speak correctly. We talk trash. The Bible tells us life and death is in the power of the tongue. So we've got to be careful what we're speaking. We believe in stuff we shouldn't be believing in. And so that starts coming up. You see, it's just stuff coming up. He's already seeing it. And he's trying to get you into the Word, to be a believer in the Word, okay, and in that truth. But instead, we, we, we read the Word sometimes, but then we believe in other things. And, and we come into Christianity and we bring our religion with us. And man, I run into that so much with people. They'll say, yeah, but doesn't the Bible say this? No, it doesn't say that. It, you know, it, it says this, you know, and, and so forth. And we need to be washed and sanctified and cleansed. And then one day we will be. The church will eventually be without spot and wrinkle. Then the Lord will take us home. And then the tribulation is going to happen. But until that time, there's a lot of spots and wrinkles. <laughs> we're still getting old and we're going to die if, we, if the Lord doesn't come and get us. Amen. Big deal. Go to heaven. But, uh, you know, he wants to present the church to himself. The church isn't into money. It's into Christ. The church isn't into, you know, knowledge. It's into Christ. You know, we're not supposed to be into this world. We're into Christ. We pray. We pray for the governments. We pray, you know, for the, st the wickedness going on in this world. We pray against that. We pray for, for souls that are heading to hell. We pray for the innocent. We pray, you know, we do all of this stuff. But we're not into that. We're into Christ. Are you with me? Amen. To be totally born again, to be a Christian, you are into Christ. If you have nothing else, you're into Christ. I mean, when Paul began to minister for, for Christ, he got a hold of them on the road to Damascus and so forth. I mean, he said, I counted all my learning, all my knowledge, everything I ever done, I counted as dung. That I may win the excellency and know the excellency of Christ. 
So he, he went into the churches and he began to reveal Christ and they wanted to kill him. That's like after I got saved, I was in a religion and I got saved and I thought my parents would be overjoyed that I, got to, I came to Christ because that's the, the, the root of what the religion was about. Instead they said I joined a cult. I said, I'm reading the Bible, I'm reading the Catholic Bible, okay? It's in there, salvation. It's all about Jesus. Why do you think I joined a cult? I came to Christ. I now have the knowledge of Him growing inside of me. And they watched me change, and eventually they believed me and they gave their life to Christ. Thank you, Jesus. All right? And that's what needs to happen. It's a process of sanctification. Now, there's a lot, a lot of churches out there full of people and they're saying some ridiculous things and people would sit there and take it, you know? And it's so sad. And when did we ever go that far in our teaching that we, we veer away from teaching about Christ? You need Christ today. Amen? Amen? Yes. He is everything. He's in every book of the Bible. I even discovered he's in the books that's not in our Bible. <laughs> Amen? I've read the apocryphal books. He's in there. Amen? So, but they, they're not canonized because there's a lot of junk in there too. But even in the, in the Koran, Jesus is a great prophet. They don't believe he's the son of God, but he's in the Koran. Muslims are having dreams about Jesus. They come into Christ while the Christians are walking away. Well, I wonder if they were even Christians to begin with. But anyway, you know, we are, we, are, we are being purged. Everything that he comes into your life to take away from you, he's got something that you've really been after all the time. Let him have it. Let him have that, that thing that's got you wrapped up on him in bondage. Let him have it. He's got what you've been looking for. Peace, joy, Amen. happiness, the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Here in John 3 it says... We continue on with, with Nicodemus. Humans can reproduce only human life. But the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. And he goes on to say the wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Okay, born of water, they're being washed. You know, it's a scripture that um, Peter writes in, in his epistle, and he talks about the flood of Noah's day. And the way he word is, words it, we got people that are preaching the doctrine of you need to be water baptized to be saved. But you need to go and just read it because it's pretty neat. And he said, the flood came in, and, and they were saved, and it's a kind of a picture of water baptismal. And then he talks about that they were saved. Well, where were they saved in? An ark. They weren't saved from the water. They were saved in the ark. But it's a picture of water baptismal because water baptismal, it cleanses us and puts the sin nature, which is killing us, into, it said, it said um, and be baptized for the remission of sin. All right. But what saved them? The ark saved them. And the ark is a type of Christ. For we are in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're born again. And you'll be saved from the flood of what's going on. He's not going to flood the earth again. It's actually going to be renovated with fire. But there is a flood of evil. There is a flood of human wisdom. There is a flood of doctrines that's out there. People say, well, this has got to be a real religion. Look, he's got, he's got 100,000 people a week attending the church. I said, that doesn't mean anything. Because the enemy is never going to fight somebody. You see, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's a cult or whatever. I'm just saying, if you're going by numbers, wow, the enemy is going to get a hold of you. Because he won't resist those that are preaching false doctrine. Right? I mean, come on, why would he? You know, the devil cast out himself. He's not going to cast out himself. He's not going to attack a person who's preaching what he wants him to preach. But he's going to attack you if you make a stand for Christ. He's going to come against you like a flood. The enemy is going to come against you with every weapon he's got. And you've got to learn how to resist him steadfast in the faith. And this is what the Holy Spirit teaches us. 
we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, he will raise us up. Amen? If we resist the devil, he will flee. So we cannot just yield, we need to resist. And then the Holy Spirit comes in, and when we don't resist because of some sin, because that's what the enemy is going to come in with. He's going to show you some pet sin that you love. And he's going to begin to tell you there's doctrines out there saying, it don't matter, go ahead, you can do whatever you want. No, you can't do whatever you want. You need to walk in holiness and righteousness. A Christian does not want to play in the world. A Christian wants to follow Christ. We want to be more Christ-like. Amen? Hmm, that wasn't a real good amen, but I'll accept it. Number three, a Christian is a worshiper who worships God in spirit and truth. They are the true worshipers. You know, I mean, I'm not the judge on who's worshiping and who's not worshiping. Because everybody worships in their own way. All right? So I can't say, well, this person isn't crying, so they're not worshiping. And they could be very well worshiping. So, but true Christians are worshipers. You know, a true Christian understands that it's not about me. All right? And when I make it about me, then I'm going to fall flat. Okay? Uh, Brother Wayne uh, turned me on to this, this guy that had died and went to heaven and he came back. And actually has his same last name. What was his name? Howard. Howard Pittman. And uh, he already went back to be with the Lord after 40 years when he came back. But he was, if you go read about his life, if he had anything to boast about, to say, I want to go back, you know, I want more years to live. And he started naming all the things. Man, he took, he took a battered children, him and his wife, into the home. And, and uh, he was a police officer. He was actually a New Orleans police officer. And I mean, when you read in his, in his testimony about all the good works that he was doing, you go, wow. I mean, this guy, he, he, he did all of this stuff. And so he's standing at the gates of heaven. And, he's, and the angel brought him there, and he's going to plead his case because he wants to come back. And he's up there, he's at the gates, he didn't see God, but God does speak to him. And when he speaks to him, after he tells him all the good works he's done, the, he, God's voice comes as a voice of judgment and says, You didn't do any of these things for me. You did every one of them for yourself. Because you're standing here now, boasting on them. You know, and so, and I, watched, I watched it, it was really good. And then I, I looked at a couple other videos that he had. And then after a while there, and he's like, oh man, everything, I don't have anything at all that's worth anything. And then the Lord's voice changes, and, and it becomes a, a voice of compassion. First, a, a voice of pity to him. You know, and, and no matter how much we do good things, our carnal nature is going to look at what I've done. Look at the money we put in here. We came back from Katrina. Look, we rebuilt this church. Look at what we've, look what we've done. We gave out groceries that didn't belong to us to begin with. And we gave them out yesterday. And, uh, and we suffered in the heat. We were sweating. Dylan almost fell on the ground. He was so hot. God was saying, y'all just did it for yourself. You didn't do it for me. Well, we wanted to. Doesn't that count for anything? How many of y'all wanted to do it for Jesus? Come on, that's true. We wanted to. But then we also want everybody to notice, hey, I'm here. Who's not here? <laughs> that's what we do. We look around to see who's not there. I remember going to work days when I used to attend the tabernacle, which was way back. Been pastoring, what, 37 years now, so I was way back. And we'd, I'd show up and it'd be always the same people for the work days. Where's all the other guys? Playing at home, cutting their grass, doing something else, you know. So we're always looking to see who's not there. I look at all the empty chairs. I know who's not here. We got a small church, you know everybody. <laughs> I know where some are. One called me and said he fell roller skating. Wait till Sonny hears this. But he fell and he hurt his neck, so we prayed, prayed with him on the phone. Roller skating said, you told me to be roller skating. I told him I was going to tell y'all. <laughs> Amen. My mom was roller skating too at that age and fell and broke her wrist. She's in heaven now, so she don't even need it. She's got a new wrist. <laughs> amen. But amen. You know, and it's just, we've got to come to a certain conclusion. You know, there's another story in the Bible 
of a Pharisee, I love those Pharisees, and a publican. Does anybody remember reading that? You know where I'm going? Nobody remember. You need to go find it. You need to read it. I want everybody, we're going to be quizzed on this next week. There was a publican and a Pharisee, all right? And they go before God, and the publican doesn't lift his face up off the floor. And he just says, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the, now the publican is an official, okay, like a judge or somebody. And, uh, but then you got the Pharisee, and he stands there the whole time going, I just thank God I'm not like this publican, a sinner. And, and, he, and so he's, he, after he just exalts himself and points his finger at the publican, the Lord just asks the crowd a question. Who walked out of there justified? The publican. Because he understood who he was. There's another story in the Bible, in the, in the Gospel of Luke, and it talks about the servant. And the servant goes out, he's hired, okay, he's got a wage or whatever it is, and he goes out and he works the field, and then he comes back in and Jesus asks them the question. Does he wait for the master to serve him? No, he's actually did only what he was hired to do. He doesn't deserve anything. See, the servant doesn't deserve to be fed. He doesn't deserve anything. He's getting his wage. He worked for a wage. Why should he get anything else? Do you realize what we do? And we went out there and gave out the food and the heat and all that? We don't deserve anything. We've been given eternal life. What more do you want? Well, I want to be healed in my body. Well, me too when I get sick. But we don't deserve it. But we can have faith and stand on a promise and receive it. But we don't deserve it. You're getting, you're getting a reward. You're going to get, you get to go to heaven. You're not going to go to hell. It, I mean, isn't that enough? But when you're in pain, we, we want more. But we don't approach it like, feed me, Lord. I've been out in that heat all day. And it says, no. He, he feeds his master first, the guy who hired him. And he just stands and waits. And when the, and when the master is finished eating, then he lets his servant eat. Okay? And so, we don't deserve to be fed. We don't deserve to have mo any money. We don't deserve anything because we have eternal life. Amen. Amen? But when God blesses us with things, there's a reason. He loves you. He's going to take care of you. Sometimes He gives abundance. And then we have to pray, what do we do with it? And there's things that we need to do with that abundance. Instead of hoarding it all. There's another story. Speaking of this, there's another story. If I keep going, we're going to be here for three days. But there's another story. There was a guy that had his barns full of seed, full of food. How many of y'all know that story? I see head shaking. Well, how come you didn't know the other one? But anyway. And, and he had all his barns full, and now he's getting a bumper crop. Why would God give him a bumper crop when he's already having his barns full? Well, he's sitting there going, hmm, what should I do with this? And God's like, you're not listening. Give it away. What should I do? He says, he's not even listening to God. And what happens? He says, I know what I'm going to do. Figured it out. I'm going to tear all my bonds down and build bigger ones. And then I'll put all the stuff that's in that in there and also everything growing right now. That too. And he sits back with his lemonade. Of course, that's not in the Bible. But he's sipping lemonade. Amen. And he's in the shade under a tree, and he's got two fans on him, and everything. That's not in the Bible either, but anyway, he's, he's all cool and everything else. And God says, You fool, your soul's required of you today. He had already had his bonds full, he had more food in his bonds to last him the rest of his life. And now he's got double, and they got people preaching that. Oh, we're children of God, we should get double portion. You should get nothing. Jesus gets the double portion. Amen. He's the one who's the God-man, the double portion. He gets everything belonging to God and everything belonging to man because of his death on that cross. Amen? Amen. You see, we've got to have the right frame of mind. Those, those prosperity, I just have a real problem, but I can't stay away from watching it because it gives me good messages, you know, on how we should not live. We should not live that way. We need to be generous. Caring, loving. You see someone in need, you, you've got to try to meet it. And if you can't meet it physically, you can meet it in prayer. 
Father, I pray that you touch that person today. That you just, just show them in your word, gospel truth, that they can be healed. Amen? Amen. And we should have that care and spirit. If you can't touch them physically because they're a stranger, you can definitely stop and pray for them right there on the spot. And then don't go before God and say, hey, I prayed for a couple of people the other day. Lord saying, I died for everybody, so you did nothing. <laughs> Amen? A Christian is a worshiper who worships God in spirit and truth. They are the true worshipers here in John 4. Jesus, well, everybody knows I use this a lot because I love this scripture. And, and Jesus is talking to this woman at the well, a Samaritan woman, okay? And he asks her for water, and she says, you don't have anything to draw with, so... And then he said, but if you'd have known, if you'd have known who it is that's asking, you would ask me for that living water. And the Holy Spirit wasn't yet poured out, but he was filled with the Spirit. And he would have given her healing and touch and deliverance as he would have poured it out to her. You don't even have a bucket. How are you going to go and get something out of this well? And he's saying, no, you don't understand what I'm, what I'm saying to you. But then he goes down, starts talking about um, worshiping and so forth. And she's all indignant, because you're a Jew, what are you doing talking to me? And she's saying that, y'all say that the true worship is worship in Jerusalem. He says, there's a time coming. Indeed, it's now, it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit, for those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. What is he saying? God is looking at our hearts. God is looking at why we do things. Why, why are we a Christian or say we are a Christian? Is there a benefit to being a Christian? Yeah, there's promises. Exceeding great promises that are given to us. Alright? That we have to use our faith to attain to. But we have to be in that same, in that correct frame of mind. You know, over in the book of Ephesians, it talks about Christ who did not think it robbery to be equal to God. Yet, he laid that down and took on a human body to be a servant of God. So he, he laid that down. He was still God. But he, he delivered, I don't know, you know, just like you have a will, you can choose to say something or not say something, right? So he just simply laid that down. I'm not going to say anything as God, because I am. But I'm going to live in this man's form to show people how to live as human beings. That, and he leaned totally on the Holy Spirit and listened totally to the voice of the Father. And he's saying, this is how you need to live. You need to live, live totally listening for my voice. You need to live totally and, and separate yourself thinking you deserve something. You're a servant. Now serve me. I'll take care of you. I will provide for you. I will touch you when you need to be touched. I will give you everything that you need to be a good ser servant to me. It's like in Romans 8.28, it says, For we know that all things work together for the good, for those who love the Lord, and are called according to His purpose. See, as long as I'm, I'm doing this, here I am, I'm preaching and do what I do, He'll take care of me, and He does. I don't have to badger him or, or start flaunting what I've done. Because he's going to tell me the same thing. You haven't done anything. And you're proving that you, you haven't done anything because now you're trying to manipulate me to give you something. And then I'm going to shut down heaven. And I'm going to shut down the blessings of God because, because now I'm using my works as something good. That the Bible says they're nothing more than filthy rags if you're doing them for that reason. But if I'm doing them in the right reason, there's a reward. There's a reward. And, and he's still going to take care of you, but now you're gaining reward in heaven for doing good works for him. We don't, we don't approach him with what we've done. We approach him for what he has done. We approach him in worship and praise and in truth being led by the Holy Spirit that's what a true Christian and that's how a true Christian lives a Christian is a follower of Christ he is a person who desires to live like Christ do you have that desire this morning 
a desire to want to be like him, to lay down. We are children of God. We've been adopted into his family. But I have a choice to make. Do I walk in that and say to God, hey, I'm your child, feed me. Or should we lay it down? I think we should lay it down. I know that I'm a child, but I'm going to be a servant. The prodigal had the right frame of mind when he finally came to his senses, laying, laying in a pig slop, feeding, eating the stuff that he was feeding the pigs. Wow, that had to be bad, huh? But he was desperate. And he said, what am I doing? I'm not worthy to be a son. I'm just going to go back and get hired by my dad to be a servant. But when he got back, what does his dad do? No, -uh, you're my son. You'll always be my son. He forgave him and he clothed him in a robe. Killed a fatted calf. But he had the right frame of mind. I'm not going to go back as a son. Hi, Dad, I'm your son. I'm coming back. You don't have to, you don't have to give me inheritance because I've already blown that. But I am a son. I'm going to come back in and sleep in my room and everything else. He didn't come back with that attitude. He came back with... Just hire me. I'll, I will live in the, in the servant house over there. And I'll just serve you for whatever you desire to pay me. That's the right frame of mind. Because when he did that, then we see that the dad said, uh-uh, you're my son. See, if we're going to be clothed upon with sonship, as a child of God, we, get, we need to have that kind of thinking. Lord, all the stuff I've ever done, but I, I'm not worthy to be your son. The Lord will say, yes you are. You are my son. But it's him saying it. Not me. I don't boast about who I am. Man, I thank God every day for my salvation. And, and I, still, I still get nervous at times thinking, I just, just hope I make it. Yeah. Paul said, we, I hardly make it. I'm a worse sinner than everybody. This was what Paul wrote. You know, so I mean, that's, I just start thinking, oh, I messed up again. I just hope I make it to heaven. I don't care about rewards. I just want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. You know, and then the Lord just comforts. He said, you're not going to hell, son. But you're going to have a little hell on earth till you let me take that thing away from you. He said, I'm not letting that happen. It's just, what is hell? It's just separation from God. Sin separates us. How many of y'all like to be happy? Me too. How many of y'all like to be at peace? I do too. How many of y'all like the rest of God to rest in His, His presence? Hey, we are all on the same page. I want all of that too. Well, this is what the Lord wants for us also. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to have peace. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to have a sound mind. He didn't give you a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. He wants you to, to have all of that. You know, I want my children to have the best. I want my children to grow up and be fed and have what they need. And now they're all grown, have their own kids. And I'm still praying for my kids that they, you know, when they get sick and when things, I pray for them and intercede for them. I'm still their dad. But they're adults now. Now I got six grandsons and I'm praying for them and interceding for them. I know what this world's trying to do. Trying to kill them. Trying to steal from them. Trying to destroy. You know? So, this is what I do. But I'm, I, I cannot stand before God and say, Hey, I've been praying for the church. I've been praying for my kids and my grandsons. And the Lord say, Guess what you deserve? Hell. Don't come to me with your good works. Let me tell you about your good works. Let me reward you for good works. But don't come tell me that you did good works. Because if right there you just null and voided everything. Anybody with me? Yes. You see when we start getting that kind of frame of mind. Boy. You're going you're to walk in his presence. You're going to walk in where he wants you to walk. You're going to be able to, to think correctly. And operate. You know with the blessings God has given you. For the Lord. And you're going to have more joy. It's just an exciting joy. I love out there in the heat talking to the people. And I say, man, I'm, I'm just so sorry how long you've been alive. Oh, no, no. No, we just, you, you're just a blessing. I'm a blessing? <laughs> you've been sitting in that car out there for three hours. 
in your air condition. But anyway. <laughs> but it's just, you know, they come out and they wait in the line and then they look, the truck is late and, and here we are in the heat, right? That's nothing. We, we've done nothing. It's just, it's exciting. I just thank God. Thank you, Lord, that we came up with this and you sent it to us and we can do it. What a joy. Amen. Amen. And there's a benefit too sometimes when they got the extra food at the end. We can actually eat some of it. That's nice too. He's a follower of Christ. Matthew 16 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Amen? Yeah, I'll go there in a second. But look at, I mean, this is, this, man, this is the most, um, how can I say this? This is the scriptures that Christians do not want to memorize. <laughs> how many of y'all memorize this? No, but well, you probably remember the good ones, right? God shall supply all my need according to the riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know, over in Philippians. But, you know, we memorize some of that. I memorize a lot of really, really good scriptures to, to build myself up, amen, in the, in the scriptures so I can be a believer in the promises of God. But this is one I do know and I have memorized it as far as I might not remember it's in Matthew 16, 24 through 25, but I definitely know the scripture very well. I take up the cross. Turn from my selfish ways. Amen? I mean, we are. How many of y'all still alive? Then you're selfish. <laughs> it's true. We have selfish flesh. You know, in, in uh, Romans 7, Paul said, when I do good, Evil is present. How many of y'all knew it said that? But this is Paul. He's saying, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. It's like, sounds just like us. <laughs> sounds just like me. Amen? And then he says, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Then he goes into Romans 8, which should, should not have changed. It should have been in the same chapter, because there's no chapters and breaks in the way it was written. And it just says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen? In the right frame of mind, having the right attitude. But in, in chapter 7, I studied it every which way I could study, because I wanted to understand... You know, how, how can we do good works and not be puffed up? Because I want to tell you right now, the evil at his presence is not the devil. Oh yeah, he's present. And there's demons that are present. But it's, that is not the evil that is present when he's doing good things. Because it's pride. You cannot get around it. Everything you do for Jesus, your flesh wants to be noticed. And at times we don't. We get away with not being noticed. But at other times it's right there. So what, and, if I, and if that's not the case, then why did he say, who's going to deliver me from this body of this death? He wasn't talking about the devil. He was talking about himself. But then he had an answer. Jesus Christ. He will deliver and the secret is, and I always ask the people this, how do you walk in the Spirit? And, they, and then I tell the Teen Challenge guys, each group that comes through for 12 years, and every year, they, I mean, all the time there's new guys, and they all say, read your Bible, pray, and do it all. I said, you, that's after you're walking in the Spirit. You're not going to read your Bible and pray unless you're walking in the Spirit. They said, well, how do you do it? I said, you want to, right, huh, Debbie? Yeah. <laughs> Taught that on Wednesday one time, and I always pick on Debbie when I do this. But anyway, you want to, right? I mean, that's the first step to walk in the Spirit is want to walk in the Spirit. You want to be a good Christian? You got to want to. You want to live the way that these scriptures I'm showing? You got to want to. If you don't take up your cross, it's because you don't want to. What is the cross? Well, everybody thinks about Christ going to die and he carried his cross. Well, that's what he was making reference to. But... He's saying, I want with my cross to pay for your sins. Okay? You pick up your cross 
to be free of your sins. Everybody got me? I took up the cross and died for your sins. You don't have to do that. But if you take up your cross, it's to want to walk in that freedom. If you want to be free, carry the cross. Carrying the cross is not freedom. Because you're carrying a cross. And he was bound to it. So you're going to be bound to it. But if you want to be free, you need to carry the cross. If you want to have life, you can't try to live and have your life. Here in John 10, 27, he said, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I think that was my last one, yeah. My sheep hear my voice. This is the good the, the story in chapter 10 of the Good Shepherd. I am the gate. People come in, find good pasture in me, and then they go back out. Back and forth we go. Okay? We come into the Lord, eat of that spiritual food, and then He sends us back out into the world. And don't hang out out there too long because He'll get a hold of you. You need to come back in, eat some more of that good pasture. He said, I'm the good shepherd. And those that follow me, those that are mine, they hear my voice. You see, they hear my voice. Now, a good sheep knows what he's designed for. Those sheep, no clue. They grow their wool, and they get shaved, and they make a covering out of it, or stuff a pillow with it, or whatever they do with it. But that's the, And then... They make good lamb chops. <laughs> yeah. Now here's the deal. Is that the Lord wants us to have the best wool around. You see. And, and we, we don't cover the sins of people. But our wool represents prayer. And intercession. And he wants us to have the best wool. That's our job. We ought to be praying for those. Just like Jesus carried he carried our cross. When we put that cross on, we need to live in that freedom and carry the cross of those people who's unsaved. We're not the Savior. And they're not going to get saved because you're carrying a cross. But it's our job to intercede. Prayer and intercession for all men, kings and magistrates and those in authority. That's what Paul told Timothy. That's our job. That's the wool that's on us as, as sheep. And then, when we are slaughtered, he wants the best meat, the best tasting lamb chops. Well, all the scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Don't you want the best from Christ? When you eat of the word of God, don't you want that to be the best nutrition? Maybe you're not understanding what I'm talking about. He said, I am food. My body is meat indeed, in John chapter 6. My blood is drink indeed. You need to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you're going to have part with me. So now, the Lord is tasting us to see if we're good. Because you are what you eat. So if you're eating of the word, eating of the truth, when he tastes you, he'll see the, you know, he'll taste the word of God. Then he'll give you, he'll purge you further so you'll taste even, taste even better. John 15 Every branch in you that doesn't bear fruit, he will cut it off. And every branch that bears fruit, he will prune that it will bear more fruit. Why? The Lord loves fruit. He likes a good barbecue too. Uh, yeah. But guess what? You are on the grill. You are on the menu for God. Well, he's on my menu. So why shouldn't I be on his menu? Because he wants to, he's tasting. Nope, he needs some more, some more time hanging in the smokehouse or something, you know. Because he's too, he doesn't taste too good. You ever been to a place that maybe you got a good steak once, you go back and then you don't get a good steak? You know, the difference in the meat, difference in the cook, difference in the spice. The Lord, when he tastes us, he, mm, we need to put him back out in the, in the smokehouse for a little while. And he doesn't quite have the right taste yet. He gets a little aggravated when people cut him off. This morning, some guy didn't even see me coming on Raleigh and almost plowed right on the side of me. 
and I honked. It, was, it would have been too late if he wouldn't have saw me because, I mean, he was within a couple of feet. And Julie went, ah! And I just kept driving. <laughs> Lord, did I, did I succeed in that one? I didn't curse him. I don't do that no more. <laughs> I didn't even give him the upper hand. I just, I just drove on by. And, and the Lord probably, probably said, anyway, you're doing better. You're doing better. You're beginning to taste a little bit better. A little bit more tender. Not so tough anymore. <laughs> It's like every time you think you got it made, somebody's going to cut you off on the road. Well, something's going to happen. And then he's going to stand back and see how you're going to handle this one. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Yes. Well, I'm glad somebody knows. It's just truth, right? Yeah. Stand on your feet, please. Yeah. You know, so I'm, I want to open up this, this front right here because I'm going to ask you a question. And... Uh, I don't want you to respond to the first question, but I'm going to respond, I'm going to ask you this question. Are you a Christian? That's my question I do want you to respond to is that, do you want to follow the Lord? And if you do, come on up to this front. So I'm not going to ask you if you're a Christian because, first off, it's not my place to judge you. And if I did... All of y'all, I love y'all, and I know that y'all are good Christians, okay? But it's really not about me, because I'm a work in progress. Anybody in here a work in progress? You better raise your hands. <laughs> Everybody in this place, we're going to be, we're going to be putting a tenderizer all the time. God loves tender steak. It tastes great. He gives us his best. He wants his best from us. Amen. 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 Uh, Jenny, why don't you let Vicki get there so she can sit in that chair right there. Yeah, there you go. Amen. Thank you, G. Well, everybody, amen. Except for the two people in the sound booth. They're doing, they're doing whatever it is they're doing. <laughs> amen. There it is, right in front of my eyes. Amen. Followers of Christ. Having that right frame of mind is what I'm talking about. Every one of us in this place are guilty. Guilty of exalting ourselves, especially before God. You know it. I know it. Those, there's a lot of times we don't. I mean, I might not exalt it before God, but then we go and exalt it before somebody. Tell somebody. Which isn't bad. I mean, it really isn't that super bad. Unless it's really prideful. But, you know, we use a good testimony. Amen about what God's going We've overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You know, so there's a, there's a place in God where we can get our works to just be pleasing to God and just leave them alone. You know what I'm saying? Just leave them alone. Just say, thank you, Lord, for giving me that privilege to be a witness, to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the afflicted, I just thank you, Lord, that you've given me, or you, you say it to God, given me that opportunity, given me a job where I'm around unsaved people to be a light and a witness, given me a chance to touch some lives that might be going into eternity soon, given you that opportunity, amen? Anybody have an opportunity to touch somebody? And you just thank God that you got that opportunity. Sometimes it gets tough too, you know? I mean, her mom, Julie's mom's really dependent on her. And at the time she's getting, she's busy, she's doing this, she's got a thousand things. Then the mom comes over. Can you come do this? Well, you know, she's got to stop. I know it. And just like I had to help my mom too is before she passed. And, and uh, you, to get in that right frame of mind. I didn't want my mom to see that she interrupted me or something. You know, but you know what I'm talking about? You know, you just don't want them to think that at all. But her mom always says, I don't want to disturb you anyway. No, mom, you're not disturbing me. Because you never know. She's 92. This could be the year that she goes home. And then, then you start living with the regrets. There's going to be regrets. You know? Some be regrets. I should, have, I should have dropped in more often. I should have, should have just went over there myself. And, you know, on and on. It just goes on and on. But, you know, if you do it with a good heart, God will make up the slack. If you're only able to give 10% to that loved one and you do it from a good heart, God will give 90%.
And in heaven, when they get there, they'll be, they'll be waiting for you to come just so they can come and embrace you. Just for, just for loving them and caring about them. May y'all have some loved ones in heaven. Amen. Amen. How many you know that they're probably there because of you as a Christian? Amen. Only God knows that. But it's like that song that I forgot the guy's name who sang it. Thank you, Lord, for giving. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I was a life that you saved, that you came and ministered to. Good song. Amen. So I want to anoint you this morning. And I want to tell you something. I really, I really feel this by the Lord. This isn't just, it is oil, but it, it isn't that. Because I'm believing that this week, that you're going to go through some things that's going to make you just let go of some things. Are you ready for this? You ready to just trust Him in a, in a much deeper way? Because that's what I, what I believe that this following Christ means. He's going to bring you to another level in trust. Followers of Christ. You know, sometimes we, if you're on a road, there's another road that runs parallel and, and takes you, maybe can take you to the same place. But sometimes we get off the road of life, it gets a little rough. It's because you're not on a road of life, you're parallel to it. Still saved, but there's things that you're going to hit potholes and bumps because that, that road there is just not the right road. And we can get sidetracked. I've been on that road too many times. And the holes remind me, this isn't the right road. What am I doing wrong? And he begins to speak to me. And begins to, um, most like immediately, this thinking pops up in my head that, whoa, that's not even scripture. Where did I get that from? You know, it's just living in this world. The book of Jude, it says, you know, we want to snatch them out of the fire. Even hating their clothes, smelling like smoke. We've got to be careful though. Got to be careful that, you know, that what they're bound up in doesn't drag us back in, into the fire along with them. Amen? Because they're out there and they got religious ways of thinking and sometimes, man, they'll make you think, whoa, is that right? You ever felt that way? Somebody tells you something religious and you just don't know if it's truth or not. You go, wow. You know, the enemy just loves to throw in lies in the midst of the truth to get us off track. But if we keep our focus just simple, just keep it simple, keep it on Christ, just, just begin to do everything for His glory, everything to reveal Him. Just keep that, just keep that simple truth. Don't worry about all the other doctrines and stuff that are out there. God will show you His truth, His doctrine. He loves you exceedingly. And you're alive because you have something to offer this world. You do. Maybe it's just one person. Maybe it's just grandkids. Maybe it's just, you know, somebody that works with you. But you have what that person needs. Amen? And do it all for the glory of God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I just pray over these. They've all appeared. Lord, they want to follow you in a better way and they want to understand Lord as they walk along with you and see just like the disciples they didn't understand all they knew how to do is fish and be a tax collector and whatever else they were doing and you changed them and you just said follow me and Matthew walked out of that tax booth and that was it never went back follow me and they followed him, but they had to be purged and trained and taught. Even Peter thought, Lord, I'll never denounce you. All these others might. And he said, this day you'll denounce me three times. And he did. He didn't know himself. He thought he could stand right to death, and he couldn't. So we can't, the Bible says, don't build yourself up more than what you are. Just know that he is everything, and then he will cause you to walk. He'll cause you to stand. And he is your all in all. So I pray over all of these, O oh Lord, that this day begins a new direction that you're walking them, you're taking them, showing them something inside of themselves. And you're going to park them until they're able to give it up. 
so that they can continue their journey in this life. So right now, Lord, I speak healing. I speak deliverance. I speak sound-mindedness, for we have the mind of Christ. I speak direction, spiritual eyes that see, a heart that understands the Word of God, a hunger for who He is and what He is. And Lord, there's nothing in this earth, nothing that we should hang on to. And you'll give us just what we need and give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.